This is the story of British World Airways Flight 4272. On the 25th of February 1994, a British World Airways Vickers Viscount was on its way from Edinburgh Turnhouse Airport to the Coventry Baginton Airport. The Vickers Viscount was a special plane. It entered service in 1953 and it was the world's first turboprop airplane. The turboprop was way better than piston engines. The turboprop was more powerful, it flew quieter, and it was cheaper to operate. Britain was at the top of their airplane manufacturing game during the mid-20th century. I mean, they innovated like crazy with the Brabazon, the Viscount, the Comet, the Trident, and even the Concorde. If you want to see a video about the British aviation industry of the 20th century, do let me know. Flight 4272 was usually dispatched at 7.30 p.m., but on the 25th, they expected the weather to get a lot worse, so they decided to move the departure up by 15 minutes. The weather for the day predicted a fair bit of drizzle and clouds between 600 and 16,000 feet. They knew that the clouds would have perfect conditions for icing. With the plane fueled up with 1,080 imperial gallons or 4,900 liters of fuel, the plane was ready to go. The plane took off at 6.43 p.m. with the captain at the controls. The weather was less than ideal. The crew had turned on anti-ice for all four engines and key areas of the airframe. As the plane climbed through the clouds to its cruising altitude of 19,000 feet, the crew got an overheat warning. The de-icing duct on the right wing was overheating. It was well above the recommended 165 degrees Celsius or 329 degrees Fahrenheit. The power unit de-icing system on engine number 2 was drawing about 16 amperes of electrical power instead of the normal 20. It was 7.13 p.m. and the crew was concerned about icing. The pilots double-checked the de-icing system and it was working as intended. Seven minutes later, the first officer observed ice on engine number four, but he wasn't too concerned as the ice seemed to be shedding. At 7.32 p.m., the plane approached 15,000 feet in altitude, and engine number two failed, and the props auto-feathered. You see, for the blades on a turboprop to generate thrust, it must be at a right angle to the oncoming air. This way, the blades can really bite into the air. However, if the engine were to fail, the blades in this right-angle configuration would generate a lot of drag. So these engines are designed to auto-feather, that is to turn the blades in such a way that they're parallel to the oncoming air. This means that the failed engines will not be generating too much drag. After having completed the shutdown drills for engine number 2, engine number 3 started to run down. The captain, realizing the severity of the issue, said, Get an immediate descent. Declare an emergency. The first officer transmitted, Manchester, Manchester, this is British Wall 4272. We've just had a double engine failure due to ice. Request immediate descent, please, and radar vectors. At this point, the plane was 16 nautical miles from Manchester Airport at 14,000 feet. Manchester Control allowed the plane to descend to 5,000 feet. Soon afterwards, Manchester handed the plane off to Birmingham. At 7.38 p.m., the plane descended through 8,400 feet, and engine number 4 failed as well. At 7.37 p.m., the first officer transmitted, Birmingham, this is British World 4272, I am declaring an emergency. Request a diversion to Birmingham, please. At this point, the plane was 28 nautical miles from Birmingham. They were given a heading of 190 degrees to reach Birmingham. Birmingham ATC asked if they wanted to divert to East Midlands, which was a bit closer. ATC informed the crew of the weather at East Midlands, but they did not get a definitive answer from the crew. After this, a win for the crew. They managed to get engine number 2 up and running again. With engine number 4 spooling down and engine number 2 starting up, the plane had started to fly 170 degrees. The controller at Birmingham suggested that the crew land at East Midlands at least twice. He even gave them a heading for the airport at East Midlands, but the plane turned away from the airport at East Midlands. The first officer tried to restart engine number 3, and the captain reported that he was starting to lose control of the plane. Things were so bad in the cockpit that the captain needed a flashlight to read his instruments. The plane soon descended through 2,500 feet of altitude, the altitude that they had been cleared to, but they did not have the power to maintain 2,500. The pilot pulled the nose up slightly in an attempt to maintain 2,500 feet, but it did not work. Pulling the nose up temporarily arrested their descent, but the maneuver had cost them 45 knots of their airspeed. The first officer kept trying to start engine number 3, but to no avail. At 7.45 p.m., the first officer transmitted two mayday calls. 
but with the electrics in shambles, no one heard that. Soon afterward, the plane hit the downward sloping forest floor, which broke the plane apart. A fire consumed the wreck. The first officer was seriously injured, but was rescued by two witnesses. The first officer survived, but the captain unfortunately did not. In any investigation, the flight recorders are of paramount importance. In this case, the CVR was recovered and downloaded successfully, but the FDR, which recorded nine parameters of the flight, was corrupted and no useful information was retrieved from the flight data recorder. The investigators suspected that the icy weather might have been what played a part in the story of Flight 4272, but there was more to it than that. The Vickers Viscount had four engines, and an engine failure, or a dual engine failure for that matter, should not result in a crash. The plane had a lot of fuel on board, so they ruled out fuel starvation as a probable cause. They turned their attention to the weather. The weather was extremely icy, and the investigators estimated that the plane spent an extended period of time in the extreme icing environment of the clouds. For example, there was a chunk of 2,500 feet of airspace between 1,000 feet and 3,500 feet where the air temperature was 0 degrees Celsius or 32 degrees Fahrenheit. This region was also accompanied by freezing rain. Remember, they passed through this bed of weather on their way down with little to no power. This might have caused ice to form on the wings of the plane, causing the pilots to eventually lose control. They talked to the first officer. He confirmed their worst suspicions. The first officer said that after each sweep of the windshield wiper blades, the windscreen would immediately ice up again. The engines ingested so much ice that the engines just failed. Had the engines been running, the de-icing systems would have taken care of the ice, but with the engines out, there was not an opportunity for the ice to melt away. Moreover, with engines 2 and 3 out, the cold, icy air might have entered the heat exchangers and the internal ducts of the wing, and thereby freezing the wing from inside as well. The Viscount is a rugged plane. It can sustain a climb even with two of its engines out. But the captain realized that with engines two and three out, they did not have any of their de-icing systems, and that's why he initiated an emergency descent. Looking back at the flight, they got engine number two running before impact. This meant that the ice on the left wing was being melted away, but the tail and the right wing were still iced up. This gave rise to a situation where the left wing was producing more lift than the right wing, an asymmetric lift situation. The ice had weighed down the plane, and with the captain pulling the nose up at 2,500 feet, they lost about 45 knots of their airspeed. Therefore, to stay airborne, they had to continue their descent. Something puzzling was the route that they took. The crew knew that their route had bad weather, but they still just flew in a straight line. No avoidance was even attempted. They found that the weather radar had not been used, which is astounding given the weather that they were flying through. The captain had a bit of a habit of not using the weather radar. Interviewing the first officer, they got to know what happened after the second engine failed. The crew did not follow the emergency checklist when engine number two failed. Keep in mind, this was a relatively low-stress portion of the flight. They missed several key steps like propeller synchronization, the correct airspeed for a restart, they forgot to close the de-icing system of engines 2 and 3 which froze the plane from within, and they did not isolate the electrical system which would turn out to be crucial later on. The checklist provided crucial information on how to deal with a crisis, and in a high stress environment they make sure that the crews have all the information that they need to deal with a situation. But the design of the checklist made it hard for the pilots to absorb information in an emergency. After the crash, one of the recommendations was to find the best checklist design to help pilots out in an emergency. As the flight went on, things got worse and worse due to them not following the checklist. Their electrical system was in shambles. The plane was plunged into darkness. But as the crisis unfolded, the pilots barely talked to each other, a clear sign that CRM, or Crew Resource Management, had broken down. Sadly, neither pilot had been trained in CRM, but they were both slated to get that training within a short period of time. Looking back at the flight path, the investigators realized that the crew could have made it to the airport at East Midlands, so why didn't they? The first officer had only declared an emergency and not a mayday or a pan-pan. And when they contacted ATC, the decision to divert to Birmingham had already been made. Moreover, the crew just did not know that the airport at East Midlands was closer. 
They never asked ATC for a diversion to the nearest airfield, and so they paid no attention when ATC suggested East Midlands. They just did not have a mental picture of the area. Now, let's finally look at the engines. The initial failures were due to very heavy icing, but the Dart 530 engines had been restarted in the air multiple times on several different occasions. But on this occasion, the engine might have frozen up with ice blocking its internals. Their incomplete checklist was now causing problems for them. The Vickers Viscount had fuel trimmers. Usually the throttle system ensures the correct air-fuel ratio for optimum performance, but under certain conditions you might need manual control of fuel flow, and that's what the fuel trimmer is for. Adjusting it adjusts the fuel that's sent to the engines. If you recall, they had not set the fuel trimmers correctly. During the crisis, it was set to 0%, and with the fuel trimmer at 0%, the restart of the engine was made that much more difficult. Without engines, the plane was flying without power. The generator on engine number one was not working throughout the flight. That wasn't a big issue. The loss of the generators from engine number two was not a big issue either. But when engine number three failed, it sent the electrical system into chaos. At this point, batteries and the generator on engine number four was powering the essentials of the plane. The crew at this point did not configure the electrics correctly, which made the problem worse. The plane needed about 400 amperes of power, but it could get by with less, and a big chunk of that, 150 amperes to be precise, was provided by the batteries. But unfortunately, the batteries started to die out minutes after engine number 3 failed. They were supposed to power things for about 28 minutes, but the batteries failed, leaving the pilots high and dry. The dual failure of engines 2 and 3 caught the crew off guard. With engines 2 and 3 out of the equation, the plane lost its de-icing capabilities in very, very bad weather. From then on, the lack of CRM just made things worse. The situation kept getting worse and worse until they hit the forest floor. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. It will really help the channel grow. A big thank you to andysvideo.com for letting me use his amazing footage on my videos. I'll catch you guys next time. Stay safe.